Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's forum on Visions for Malaysia Beyond 2020. I'm Wu Wing Tai, the lucky person who is president of the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. Today's forum is a joint activity with the newest think tank in town, the Centre. The Centre was founded by Kairi Jamaluddin and Sharil Hamdan, and the CEO is Dr. Ilan Rahib, Rabila Sakaria. The Jeffrey Chia Institute is most delighted to partner with the Centre because both our organizations share a commitment to the values of non-partisanship, compassion, and pragmatism. Let me invite Dr. Idlan on stage to briefly introduce her organization to you. Dr. Idlan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Profu. Um, Wabi Jintong, Wabi Iza, uh, Wabi Kairi, and dignitaries and fellow guests. Um, the center is very honored to be able to host our first and hopefully of many events in collaboration with the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia at Sunway University. Um, as far as think tanks go, as Prof Wu mentioned, uh, we're one of the newest kids on the block. And some of you might be quite unfamiliar, unfamiliar with um, who we are and what we do. So I hope you'll um, indulge me for a while while I kind of briefly, and I'll try to be brief, um, introduce ourselves to you. Uh, as Prof Wu mentioned, the center is, or uh, was founded by YB Kairi and um, Sharil Hamdan, conceptually perhaps um, in 2018, but it came into physical fruition in 2019, and we formally opened our doors to the public um, by way of launching our website, um, www.center.my, uh, at the end of July 2019. When I say at the end of July, it was literally 31st of July. Um, so in that respect, we are merely only a few weeks old, but the need for a, a non-partisan centrist platform is not something that is new. It is in light of the recognition of the need for a platform where centrist views can be discussed and debated in a healthy manner and a mature manner. It was um, this thinking that um, led to the center coming into being. So in sum, who or what is the center? Well, we're a research organization dedicated to centrist views in the Malaysian context. Our core team members um, come from very diverse backgrounds, but we all share a commitment to the values of non-partisanship, compassion, and pragmatism. So um, it would have not escaped many of you that our, our founders, our two founders, are members of a political party. But as an organization, we are non-partisan. Our team hold different political viewpoints, and party politics plays no role in how we do our research. Um, as an organization, we want to work with everyone um, who wishes to bring out centrist solutions to existing problems that we have in Malaysia with the aim of building our country towards a better um, Malaysia. We find it particularly important to view centrism in the Malaysian context, not in the least because what we commonly consider to be centrism is largely colored by the way it is practiced in the West. This serves to be a good comparator, obviously, but we need to acknowledge that the political evolution and maturity of Malaysia as a country does not mirror the West or other Western nations. And in that vein, any kind of ideas, concepts, and philosophies from the West cannot be wholly transplanted without appropriate contextualization. So in the context of um, centrism, that the way that we view it at the center, from the perspective of economics, Centrism would involve questioning the balance between free markets and um, government regulations to deliver desired socioeconomic um, outcomes and solutions to problems um, around the areas of employment, decent income, affordable housing, environmental sustainability, among um, 
a multitude of other issues. From the social dimension, um, we take the position that centrism believes in respecting individual liberty, but balancing it against the responsibilities of being part of a diverse society. With Malaysia's unique demographics and history, centrism here attempts to find a workable balance between the expectations of all communities and the realities of managing a stable multi-ethnic nation. So, with that in mind, the center aims to bring about a number of things. First, we would like to um, offer a platform for education and discussion regarding policies and the political economy of the country for everyone who's interested. And we hope that a lot of people are interested. Um, and we do this by providing research content on our website delivered in a digestible and easy to understand format. And then to use social media to encourage debate about these issues, which our research raises. We don't want to operate in a vacuum. We want to be able to debate, discuss, and provide workable solutions with a view to affecting change in policy, but never losing sight of the fact that policy needs to be rooted in strong research and evidence. Second, we want to be a platform for dissemination of research, in particular social science research, from academia. And I'm speaking about this coming um, from the background of um, academics myself and also a social scientist. Too often, good research remains on the pages of academic journals and not in the sphere of policy or other arenas where impact can be made in a meaningful way. Perhaps through no fault of anyone in particular, because the connecting bridges are still only beginning to be built. I mean, um, our universities in Malaysia are burgeoning with e uh, academic talent, producing research of an international standard, providing solutions to a multitude of problems in innovative and intelligent ways. So we believe that there is space for conversation between academia and policymakers, and the center wants to be part of this conversation partially facilitating the discourse, but also working with experts in producing that research as well. Finally, I'm coming to the end of my bit, we aim to continually organize forums such as this to allow for meaningful, mature discussion across the political divide, where progressive ideas can be put forward in a pragmatic way towards collectively building a Malaysia with a thriving future. And on the note of the future, we come back to today's forum, Beyond 2020, Fresh Views, New Visions. Our three distinguished guests are here today to share with us their visions for Malaysia as the clock ticks ever closer to that iconic year 2020. And with that, I take my leave because they're the guys you want to come and listen to, not me. Thank you very much. Well, let's... Uh begin today's event. Let me invite on stage the three speakers, uh, Karyu Jamaluddin, the Member of Parliament for Rambau, and the second person bow to the audience and let's come out. <laughs> second is uh, Nuru Iza, Member of Parliament for Pemantang Bao, and the third is Liu Jin Tong, the, Minister, the Deputy Minister of Defence. Well, today we will see that being a centrist doesn't mean being a fence sitter. And so we will begin with uh, Kairil Jamaluddin. And why don't you start off, kick off today's event? Would you like to speak at the rostrum? Welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu, for the introduction. Thank you to Dr. Idlan also for explaining what uh, the centre is. Honestly, um, I, I couldn't have explained it better. Everyone's asking what, what is a centrist, what does the centre do? I didn't know until this morning. Thank you, Idlan. Um, uh, YB uh, Chintong, Deputy uh, Defence Minister, uh, YB Nur Iza, Member of Parliament for Permatang Pau. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Jeffrey Chat Institute for collaborating with the center on our first, um, first event. Um, I told Idlan that uh, you know we, we've already launched the website and our research pieces. Now we've got to get out there and, and start talking to people in real life. Um, and as with any think tank, the biggest consideration for having events is cost. So I said try and get an event where we can do it for free. So thank you very much, JCI, for I I indulging. And we'll try to do this more often, ho hopefully. Um, we decided that the first thing that we want to talk about is something actually quite topical. Uh, for Malaysians of my vintage, my generation growing up, um, Vision 2020 has always been something in the distant, in the distance, in the far, far uh, future. Uh, and, and for many of us, actually, um, it's still in the far future, only it's not. It's just a few months away. Um, you know, I grew up thinking that well, 2020 is like really long time away and, you know, we'll have a different prime minister by then, he's back. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and guess what? I mean, you know, we're, we're in injury time already, basically. Um, and, and this is a vision that I grew up with. You know, I was born in 1976, uh, similar generation to Chintong and, and Isa. Uh, and, and this is all, you know, we were indoctrinated to think that this was the, the, the end all and be all of our existence. And that, you know, this is our big coming out party next year uh, as, as a high income first world country. Um, so... You know, as we get closer to the date, I think it's opportune for us to think about what happens next. Uh, you know, do we need a new vision uh, past Vision 2020? And of course, there have been attempts at this. Uh, but, you know, it's a good time for us to, to think about um, what happens beyond 2020. Fresh views, new vision. But the first thing that I wanted to talk about, maybe ask rhetorically, is do we even need this vision thing anymore? I mean, it, it sounds very 1990s, this, this having a vision kind of thing. It sounds very anachronistic, a thing of the past. I mean, do we really need a vision? It sounds like, you know, parading your military hardware during your National Day Parade. It's like really old-fashioned. Um, do we still need this anymore? Surely once we get to 2020, or uh, its injury time version called Shared Prosperity in 2030, um, we should ditch this, these grand sweeping goals and actually focus on getting the small things right. Efficiency gains, leaner organizations, incremental tweaks. I mean, this is what governing in the modern age is about. It's about, uh, you know, the small uh, levers uh, to make things work better rather than sweeping visions that really don't get us anywhere. And after all, grand visions, they set us up for disappointment because they are hardly met in reality. And in a toxic world of spoiled brats on social media, cynicism just drowns out any call to arms for a nation to create a new arc of history based on some collective aspiration of where and what we want to be as a people and civilization in X number of years. But I guess call me a sucker, because despite of that, I still believe that there is a place for having a vision. I may be biased in all of this because my last acts as a minister in the last government was trying to anticipate things to come and to use a now cliché term, future-proof uh, Malaysia, at least for the next 30 years. We identified the megatrends and curated thousands of aspirations to come with policies and programs that could cushion Malaysia from all these upcoming disruptions. Unfortunately, Visions in the Malaysian context are highly political, and to the victor goes the spoils. TN50, or Transformasi National 2050, was dismissed pre- and post-general election as a political project, and now, post-general election, has been cast away into, into the rubbish bin of political history, together with other visions like the Asian Renaissance and Islam Hadari, etc., etc. Uh, and maybe to be resurrected one day when there are new winners in politics. But it was precisely because of the political nature of visions that I stressed while being the principal interlocutor for TN50 that it was not conceived to negate Vision 2020, which of course had another political context to it, but rather to project beyond the year 2020 into a world in which the original nine challenges of Vision 2020 never even fathomed or imagine. So despite the fleeting nature of visions in Malaysia, because every new leader and his team want their own imprimatur, 
and cannot wait to erase their predecessor's prints, I still believe it's good counsel to try the vision thing once again. Which is why the center, which I founded with uh, Sharil Hamdan, has collaborated today with the Jeffrey Chia Institute to bring together a bipartisan panel. So that if one day we agree on a new vision, at least there is already some cross-party buy-in and the problem of politicizing visions can be mitigated slightly. Also, I might add that uh, the members of this panel uh, were carefully selected. They represent, in my mind at least, the centrist voice in their respective parties. Their parties may be dominated at any one time by less than centrist voices, such as mine, but they, or we individually, represent the moderate faction of our parties. Liu Chintong is in many ways the KJ of DAP. <laughs> a reasonable, a reasonable, moderate centrist in DAP, like me in AMNO. Basically, Liu Chintong, like KJ, is a minority of one in DAP. Back to the vision thing. I want to start by specifically zooming in on five considerations before we even think about the fine print of a, of a vision. One is geopolitics. A national vision must start by imagining our place in the in community of nations. We have heard about Malaysia being spoken of as a middle power, a phrase that Chin Tong uses. One that has perfected the hedge between the two competing superpowers in the region, one that is respected in the Muslim world and in the developing world. But this will evolve over the next 30 years. One of our neighbors will become one of the biggest economies in the world by 2050. As strategic competition heats up and utilizes new technology like AI, can we even survive as a middling middle power? Will we be seen as a model Muslim majority nation with the rise of identity politics. So to project a new vision, we have to understand where we want to place Malaysia in the global context and with geopolitical shifts happening on a daily basis. Second is economic. What is the grand economic narrative? Where are the engines of growth for the future? We have had great engines of growth up to date, but they cannot last forever. Export-oriented manufacturing, commodities, minerals, oil and gas. Some of these things we lose comparative advantage. Some of these things deplete over time. Our neighbors have upped their game. Indonesia leverages on their size to create technology unicorns. Thailand has developed food technology to add value to traditional sectors like agriculture while investing in industrialization, whereas here in Malaysia we've seen years of deindustrialization. Singapore has moved from being a finance hub to a high-tech finance hub. Vietnam has emerged as the real emerging tiger of Southeast Asia. What do we do with sectors which will experience a slow death? Sectors which we don't really talk about in KL. Subsistence fishing communities, commodity smallholders, rubber tappers and things like that, which are not sustainable in the future but something that requires strategic shifts, upskilling, reskilling, removing and, trans and locating, dislocating communities. And anchoring an economic vision is how do we train and educate young Malaysians for uncertain and a disruptive future? What skills are needed? And what skills are needed over the next 20 to 30 years? Third consideration is socioeconomic. I think there is cynicism towards grand visions in Malaysia, because the mantra is shared, but not the benefits. Vision 2020 was about a high income nation per capita, but the median wasn't that important. The Gini coefficient wasn't that much of a concern. What mattered was if a per capita average could be demonstrated that we became a high income nation, then we were high income. That's not only unfair, but it does great disservice to the vision because most Malaysians will be robbed of the promises of that vision. And that vision becomes unrelatable. You need a vision that is relatable, not just in words, but also in deed. Fourth is national identity. And this is topical today. I think Malaysians are largely still parochial and racial. Yes, we can aspire towards equality. 
but we need to confront hard truths about why Malaysians think the way they do. Now, many people in Malaysia palm this off and say it's because of racial politics that we are like this. I don't think politicians and politics can be absolved completely of the present fractured state of Malaysian society. But is politics also not, in some ways, a mirror of society? Politicians can make things better or worse, but they are responding to a ground reality that is out there. Malays feeling under siege, non-Malays feeling marginalized. Now, if we're not empathetic enough to understand from different perspectives, there can be no vision of what it means to be Malaysian in the future, because we will never overcome the hang-ups of the past. Fifth, and perhaps most pressing, is sustainability. The world is burning. The seas are rising. President Jokowi is moving his capital because the current one is sinking. Greta Thunberg is on a zero emissions yacht sailing across the Atlantic to speak at a climate conference because she doesn't want to take a plane. My 11-year-old son left for China yesterday morning to save the whale shark, which I didn't even know was endangered. Past visions have been too materialistic. In fact, did you even know that in the nine challenges of Vision 2020, there is not even a mention of the environment or safeguarding our natural resources? That was 1990. And the way we thought in 1990, not even a mention of safeguarding future, the future of our natural resources. So a new vision must be anchored on the premise that we need the earth and humans to be, long, to be around long enough to continue to have more and more visions into the future and not end up being endangered like the whale shark. And what is Malaysia's role today in stopping the climate from burning beyond our circumspect involvement in international conference, conferences? So those are the five considerations before we even think about a vision. What then are the anchors of a new vision? I think it must be anchored on values. Let's revisit Vision 2020 again. Vision 2020 was actually values laden. If you look at the nine challenges, it was all about values. Different values, progressive, scientific, caring society, all about values. But somewhere along the way, these values became submerged and subservient to pretty much whatever number stood for becoming a high income nation, which is 12,000 US dollar per capita, according to the World Bank definition last year. So that number became the end all and be all of Vision 2020. It wasn't the values that underpinned it. Rather, it was just this, this material number. Everything was directed towards achieving this number. Didn't really matter that inequality was on the rise. Subsidies were used regressively. Foreign labor came in by the millions because we needed to feed the economic engine and machine to achieve that number. I'm not saying numbers will be un unimportant. Of course, we need targets and benchmarks. But they must be subservient to the values that will bend the arc of our future. What then are these values? We have to decide together. But I, today, I can say at least four. I want something that is fair. I want a vision that's sustainable. I want a vision that's innovative. And I want a vision that is compassionate. These four values or characteristics or whatever you want to call it must anchor our new vision. And any numbers or metrics that follow must be anchored to achieve these values and whatever other values we collectively decide as Malaysians. Fairness may not mean complete equality, but it will certainly mean equal opportunity. It will also mean breaking traditional structures which discriminate against Malaysians based on gender, ethnicity, or whatever else in all sectors of Malaysia. Will it be painful? Yes. Will we be better off for it? Eventually, yes. But in this, you will need leaders who can withstand the blowback, that can rise above the noise and communicate directly with the people, to cajole allies, to arm twist opponents if necessary, to become the fox and not the hedgehog in Isaiah Berlin's analysis of leaders. Sustainable because we want a vision that puts Malaysia in the long game, not the short game. Not just a middle power today, but a upper middle power in the future. With our forests intact, with our rivers clean and flowing, with our corals alive, continuing to be a carbon sink for the world. Innovative, because in an age of disruption,
If you don't learn and unlearn and learn again, you lose. It's as simple as that. I put compassion in because notwithstanding the toxicity and cynicism that you see daily, especially in social media, and perhaps because of it, we need this virtue at the heart of our vision in how we treat everyone, especially in the words of Freddie Mercury in Under Pressure, and love dares you to care for the people on the edge of the night. I wanted Isa to come today because she has been working hard on criminal justice reform and harm reduction for drug users precisely by putting compassion at the center of her work. Lastly, the center recently published an editorial in search of vision for our times. We wrote about what are called moonshot goals, moonshot goals. A moonshot refers to Jack Kennedy's challenge in 1961 to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. In other words, trying to do something really difficult and maybe even totally crazy. But in chasing that moonshot, you spawn innovation, technology, human capital, industries, and ideas that will last for generations. Maybe Malaysia needs our moonshot. It could be a carbon neutral country by 2050. And we singularly direct ourselves towards that moonshot goal, creating the green tech that we need, creating jobs in green technology, changing behaviors and lifestyles, upending our transport system, killing the new national car, and creating more lanes for trams and buses, <laughs> monetizing. Unless it's electric car. <laughs> yeah, unless it's electric car. Monetizing sustainably our natural resources and more. That's just an example of what a moonshot is. Or the moonshot can be, you know, multiple Nobel Prize winners and building an ecosystem around directing research towards multiple Nobel Prizes. Or a moonshot could be a cultural economic powerhouse like Korea exporting everything from their TV shows to BTS. Or a moonshot in becoming the most livable city or the liv most livable country in the world with urban design and friendly immigration policies. I have to explain what Moonshot is because otherwise the press is going to say the takeaway from today headline, KJ, kita letak rakyat Malaysia di bulan. <laughs> and in a headline, headline reading generation, that's going to be it for today. You see, when we aim for the moon, we forget the gutter that we sometimes find ourselves in. And that's precisely why we still need a vision. I thank uh, YB Chintong and YB Iza for, for being here. Uh, as Dr. Idlan said just now, the center is a non-partisan platform. Uh, but maybe, but maybe uh, another moonshot is we need a centrist political platform in the future that can corral and direct sensible ideas and sensible sensitivities towards a, a political movement and platform that can make sense of Malaysia today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, YB Kairi, talking to us that uh, the importance of having a green approach in policy objectives, and going for a moonshot. It is not the green and the moon of past you're talking about. <laughs> That's the past. So we'll move on now to YB Nuru Iza, who would give next. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Dr. Idlan, yeah? uh, as the CEO of the center, YB Chintong, Deputy Defence Minister of Malaysia. YB Khairi Jamaluddin, Member of Parliament for Rambau. Prof Wu, Wing Tai, our moderator for today. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, dignitaries, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, salam hormat. Uh, salam centrist. Eh? <laughs> today is a very special day indeed because it pro uh, proves to be a legitimate gathering of centrists. Uh, that's what I like to think, uh, all of, it, of, of us here. Reform-minded centrists. Uh, it's been a climate that has been deeply polarized, both religiously and racially. I'll not go deep into the issue, but seriously, we are running out of time, you and I. We need to solve Malaysia's many problems, 
actual problems stemming from stagnant wages, widening inequality, lack of qualified positions for higher skilled graduates, and the sad reality of being amongst the dumping ground for the wasteful, more developed nations. I'm sure there's many more problems that we have to solve. Now, these urgent challenges are best managed with reasoned arguments, devoid of emotional intensity by centrists, I would argue. As such, thank you so much uh, to Ibi Hairi, the Idlan, the organizers, uh, Jeffrey Chah Institute of, uh, on Southeast Asia, and of course, um, congratulations to the center for the recent launch and having me be part uh, of this opportune discourse. Thank you to all of you as well for uh, making time to come at lunch hour, devoid of lunch. I can hardly believe it myself, um, but in a couple of months, uh, we will enter the year 2020. Again, you know, um, of repeated vision 2020 of my childhood, uh, as Khairi mentioned, and now suddenly I'm asked to cross over beyond. And people are asking the question, what will the future hold in the next decade? And that's a scary thought, actually, um, for someone like me. Uh, so what now? Well, I have had the benefit of hearing the first panelists outlined the vision of Malaysia's future. I've also read the center's editorial. Huh? Um, it's indeed a shared vision uh, by many of us, centrists, reformists, progressives alike. Now, I'm going to take one of that moonshot goal they suggested, which is the need to ensure that no one lives in poverty by 2030 based on an updated and widely accepted definition of poverty. And of course, being food sufficient and replenishing our fishing stocks by 2030. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's accept this as our joint objectives, yeah? Because for me, the question I keep asking myself time and again, how do we get there? What are the building blocks that we have to build? I've been an elected member of parliament since 2008, pursuing the reform agenda, and I'm constantly reminded a year passes by very fast. Before you know it, as Safia, my eldest daughter, always reminds me, your five-year job contract ends, Mama. You will have to do your best to earn the next uh, contract. Not, not easy, no elections. Um, but the point is, she keeps reminding me that it is an important job that you have to take uh, full responsibility in implementation of things that have the best impact on society. So I'm always in a state of urgency to realize reforms at the ground level. Reforms or islah mastata'tum. Uh, you change things the way they are being done for the better. And reforming a lembah pantai, then in 08, uh, devoid of constituency allocation funds, helped me rely on immensely brilliant collaborators. Dr. Idlan was right, you know, I mean, there's so many brilliant publications, uh, research, uh, great work that's been done by, by Malaysians in our midst. So it, it really pushed me to implement super small scale projects and programs, but which have the highest social impact on the lives of my constituents. And for me, that is the reform agenda realized. So today, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to share the ongoing social impact agenda, realized reforms running in Pramatang Pao that are in line with the aforementioned vision. We harness the power of collaboration with enterprising individuals and experts to help us get to where we need to go. Now, all of us actually, uh, we, um, I see us as enablers, whether government, federal or state, uh, legislators, uh, local leaders at all levels, we enable such visions by having the internet of things to implement the changes we seek. Instead of allowing politics of all things to unnecessarily reign. We've got much work to do, but very little time. So while it's crucial to have a, a central governmental narrative, I agree, it, it, it should be embraced by everyone, whether what was in 2020, TN50, whatever it is, it has to be clear cut and something that can escape the partisan political trap. So in initiating much needed reforms, we have to jointly realize the national vision through pockets of successes, grassroots based projects that work. And these successful modular building blocks, inshallah, can easily be replicated 
should lead policy and programs at the national level. We might not be subject matter expert ourselves. Please, you know, if every member of parliament is considered a subject matter expert, there goes our future. But why on earth are we not able to accelerate, facilitate and empower subject matter experts to do what they do best? So that should be our job, you know, uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. And one obvious group that needs help are those in poverty, those who are living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck and barely able to survive. And as obvious as this group may seem, um, I believe with better, more encompassing, multi-dimensional measurement of poverty, we will be able to help them far more effectively. So part of the vision mentioned today is ending poverty by 2030 using a new measurement. And it would not be sufficient merely to measure income levels. Poverty goes beyond how much money one does or one does not. Other factors matter, including geography, access to education, and infrastructure. And this brings me to my first pilot. We have been fortunate enough to encounter the work by Professor Fatima Kari from University of Malaya. I've been following her since my days in Lembah Pantai, and she has now developed Malaysia's very own multidimensional poverty index. Yeah? Now, this index was developed based on her earlier research on Malaysia's EPF retirees and how little they make. Yeah? and intended for computing acute poverty, which refers to two major characteristics. The first, people, it comprises people living under conditions where they do not meet the lowest internationally agreed upon standards in indicators of basic functioning. Uh, it includes uh, being well nourished, being educated, and having access to clean drinking water. Second, it refers to people living under conditions where they don't meet the lowest level of standards, but in various aspects at the same time. So the MPI is able to compute those experiencing multiple deprivations. And we will run this new index to measure the level of poverty in Pramatang Pao, and it will cover deprivation in terms of health, the health condition of the person, whether he or she has an insurance or not. Number two, education, the years of schooling. Number three, living standards, um, having means of transportation, home ownership and finances after retirement. And finally, economic activity to indicate income after retirement. So NNPI will ensure an in-depth and easy way to comprehend an integrated view of poverty that allows for change over time because it's dynamic, right? Um, someone passes away or, or, or there's a disease re you know, within the family, you have to be able to then target them more effectively and inshallah end poverty by 2030 with better, more encompassing measurement. Ladies and gentlemen, the poor are also the majority of those placed behind bars. This brings me to an important vision for this country and I've had the rare chance to discuss and find out that the Prison Department of Malaysia, Jabatan Penjara Malaysia, aims um, as, as much as 75%, to target 75% of eligible non-violent criminals are rehabilitated by 2030 through community corrective programs. So I was so shocked. I mean, you know, I usually we visit Suyambulu prison uh, for many years. Uh, we, yeah, we're quite a fond of it a bit, yeah. So, but to, to listen to them, right, have this really well thought plan to make sure the overcrowding is addressed, to give second chance to the non-violent criminals wanting to change, it was very, it was very um, touching for me. It was very important because I felt, you know, we could escape. We know what's going to happen, what's the exit plan. But for those not having legal counsel, uh, desperate just to to make ends meet while the husband is uh, imprisoned, what about them? So their target of allowing for eventual immersion of former non-violent convicts is in line with the vision of reducing the number of incarcerated persons in Malaysian prisons by 2030. That should be our vision. So while we await approval from the ministry, it's useful to remind ourselves that we have as many as 60% of those in prison due to drug-related crimes not to mention 73% of 
of prisoners on death row are drug offenders themselves. If you don't believe me, just check the center's website. It's there. So you solve the drug problem, you lessen the number imprisoned. As such, one of the key building blocks in sourcing a solution is to spread awareness on harm reduction programs. Yeah? The Ministry of Health currently has 900 harm reduction centres nationwide, but there hasn't been um, proper and thorough immersion between existing other programmes that help in addressing addiction. So enter Malaysia. You know, one day I, I had this opportunity and I met Malaysia's very own methadone man. Professor Hussein Habil. And the man who was responsible not just to bring in methadone usage awareness in Malaysia, but the whole harm reduction uh, scope, eventually reducing the transmission of HIV through needle sharing infections from 80% to 3%. Okay, can you imagine that? And he was also instrumental with the team at University of Malaya in the SEDA, Spiritual Enhancement and Drug Addiction Rehabilitation Project, dispensing methadone to willing heroin addicts in a holistic bio-psycho-spiritual social program with the highest success rate of drug recovery. They have been published internationally. So by 2011, Malaysia was a global pioneer, 2011, yeah, in providing methadone in the mosque. Masjid Ar Rahman, Kampung Kerinci. I remember visiting, uh, and I knew then I had to bring this into fruition when I had the chance. So now that I remember a parliament in Permatampau, what's to be done? Replicate and with a touch of Islah Master Taktum. We presented the project proposal to the Penang Mufti, Datuk Wan Salim, and he approved SEDA to run in three mosques all over Pulau Pinang. So this was really, um, for me, one of the most uh, memorable decisions because it just took one meeting, he heard the experts, he met the methadone man, and he gave his nod. So can you imagine the impact? Impact of having mosque committee members who are completely supportive of harm reduction as a means of addressing drug addiction in this country. Okay, Once replicated, we will be able to convince the majority of the population and change mindsets forever from looking at addiction as criminal to addiction as an illness. And the most workable program to address addiction in this country must reign supreme and replicated at every drug-related agency in Malaysia. The current war on drugs has to be reformed to something that works and within our midst. You, know, you see, Portugal, the leading standard for harm reduction programs in the world, did exactly that a focus on treating individuals who were heavy drug users at the grassroots level and led to a societal shift in how people viewed them and eventually the national program. You know, it was a national program towards ensuring that drug users were helped instead of being punished. And I think that's why problems and challenges must be looked and reframed from position of centrists. And I've uh, spoken before about collaborators now, ladies and gentlemen, all these collaborators are utilizing technology and innovation to drive their creative solutions. For example, the methadone dispensation. There's going to be a mobile methadone van created by Professor Rushdi of University of Malaya. So, you know, there's going to be steady supply of methadone. The issue is, the brilliance is, you know, among us. It's just you decide to enable them or, or not. That's why if we envision achieving, oh, the next one, yeah, uh, if you envision, for example, um, achieving national food security by 2030 and widespread access to safe pesticide-free produce, I believe that precision farming is the way forward. I mean, it's, again, another no-brainer. And uh, at present, our food situation is precarious. We have 130 million new babies coming into the world every year, um, increasing the demand for food. We have irreversible climate change being more and more of a lived reality, threatening farmers and people's dinner plates everywhere. There's really not much choice that we have. We do need to adopt modern farming to ensure that we can still grow the fresh produce to, need to meet the growing demand with no hidden added chemicals and poisons to boot. I would also add, Wabi Chin Tong, this is a, you know, it's an area of defense, our strategic uh, concern, food security. 
And again, my years in Lembah Pantai helped me source yet another reform-minded centrist collaborator, Carl T. Veet. Uh, John Yi and Liang, they developed their homegrown technology, enabling us to grow kale. Anyone from Bangsa here? Huh? Kale. Imagine growing kale in Malaysia. Yeah. Even kale in Kappa, in regulated greenhouses. Now, Dias is a two-acre precision farming center based in Kappa, Slango, that utilizes urban farming technology which can regulate growing conditions and optimize growth. In this center, crops like uh, romaine lettuce, tomatoes, kale, they're grown in small biodegradable pods. Even those who are visually impaired can basically work there because there's braille written all over the pods. And it's Malaysian made. Malaysian items under tightly controlled conditions. So through this system, crops grow 30% faster at a 98% success rate. All the while reducing costs, minimizing waste and decreasing carbon footprint. And we are going to bring this inshallah to Permatang Pau because it is a crime not to. So there have been too many farmers in Permatang Pau that I've met, um, like the late Inchik Shahizan Muhammad Sa'ad and Arwah Patam. They suffer through the excessive use of chemical pesticides. They die before they even reach 50 years old. I mean, this, this has to change. I want to make sure the next generation of farmers have a better life. They are the ones producing our food. So we are in the midst of getting approval for the first acreage, and I'll do whatever I can with the rest who are supportive of this vision to enable the experts to do their bit. So our plan is to have an end-to-end -end agripreneur based solution. Yeah, and we also aim, and you know, you also want to change mindsets, right? So we also aim to equip all Majlis Pengurusan Community Kampung at the local level with a conditional grant. You want your money? Can. Don't uh, make sure there's no open burning taking place. And then additionally, we also are asking that all organic waste will be turned into compost via a composting machine made by UITM Permatang Pau, already a successful composting machine. So I always say when they sigh and they complain, Islah masta taktum, you know, reform for the better, inshallah. So we must do all this to ensure we achieve food security by 2030. So um, my final point and conclusion, how do we differentiate ideas, ladies and gentlemen, between the actual mana from heaven to impractical illusions of grandeur lacking in solid economic and social footing? Your old uncle's not very fresh ideas, lah, yeah? for example. So Agency Innovasi Malaysia came up with an independent social progress assessment index, uh, I think part of the TN50 uh, at the time, to measure the social impact of efforts made by public as well as private social enterprises who utilize or which utilize government subsidy or grants. So for a start in Permatang Pao, we'll measure the impact of all our projects through joint studies that we aim to publish to learn from our mistakes and expand on key wins. I'm sure there's many other similar efforts, but the issue is you don't want to work in silos. You want scalability for a successful modular pilot. And that's how you make sure you achieve that grand vision together. Furthermore, we need more, uh, better open access to government data, which will allow subject matter experts and lay people alike to keep the nation's leaders accountable to find any marginalized groups that slip through the cracks. So ladies and gentlemen, we're running out of time. You and I, we can't afford to allow great ideas to pass us by unheeded, unimplemented. And borrowing from the center uh, of YBKJ, our moonshot goals must be achieved. We're moving on from 2020, and it starts with whatever it is that we're doing today. And we want not just ourselves, but also Mother Earth to live long and prosper. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Thank you, uh, Prof Wu, um, Dr. Ilan, uh, YBKJ, uh, YBIZA, uh, fellow Malaysians, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today, we are honored to be here because this is a uh, ISA's uh, first national event after hibernating in Permatang Pau for a long time. <laughs> it is also uh, KJ's uh, moonshot goal to be um, the next Prime Minister before he turned 50 after missing the 40-year-old deadline. 
We all know that KJ wanted to be PM uh, when he turned 40. <laughs> and uh, the good thing is that he, want, he wants to be Prime Minister from the centre, and I think that is something that I shared, uh, that we should uh, govern from the centre. Uh, now, before we go into the vision thing, I would like to ask ourselves, where are we and how do we see Malaysia? I think it's important for us to rethink how we see Malaysia. Uh, we, when we look at the map, and the map constrains the way how we see Malaysia, we see two land masses. Or, well, we see the peninsula, we see Sabah Sarawak. So we conceive Malaysia as the two land masses. And I actually hope to create a map that actually look at also our sea boundary, yeah? our maritime boundary. Actually, we, our metric, metric, maritime boundary is uh, two uh, double the size of our land boundary. So we have our maritime boundary. We are dealing with uh, Straits of Malacca, South China Sea, and the Sulu Sea. And this is actually within our water, and this is where, especially Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea, are the most important water in the world. And beyond that, we are at the end of Europe-Asia continent. And we are between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Malaysia is at the center of all this. I mean, if you think that way, and we should see ourselves in relation to the world and to our region and not just with it. With that, then we can actually envisage where we want to be and what we want this nation to be. We are in a very interesting and difficult time. The world is coming to a different era now. 1989, we saw the end of, well, the, the coming uh, down of Berlin War and the beginning of US dominance, the beginning of an era which was um, driven by neoliberal ideas in economics, but in terms of world peace, uh, in terms of trade, in terms of uh, communication, in terms of uh, integrations, it was fairly peaceful and overall relatively pros prosperous without much uh, major war. But I think 2019, that era is coming to a full stop. We are me moving into strategic competi competition between China and the US. We are looking at a situation where at some point Iran, China, Russia and maybe North Korea will be even closer. We're looking at a situation where uh, we will have to deal with a lot more global challenges and some of them may be at our doorstep in South China Sea. But is this a new Cold War? I don't subscribe to that. The last Cold War happened when there was no, uh, that when most nations were colonies of European powers but now, Malaysia as a country that is not big, not small, uh, we can call it a middle power or aspire, an aspiring middle power, we have our own agency. We can make decisions that may not necessarily change the scenario fully, but we can change some events, and some of these events may also change the outcome of the world. And together with other countries, uh, we can play an important role in the world and we can punch above our width. I think for a nation, it is important, especially for Malaysia, which is geographically not very big, and in terms of population size, also not very big, we must attempt to punch above our width. And in our history, we have this history, we have this experience of punching above our wave and influencing global events previously. And this is where I think we should begin, by looking at ourselves 
looking globally, looking regionally, and looking beyond our land boundary, but looking into something bigger so that from there, we build what is Malaysian. And we're also at an interesting time in Malaysia. I joined, well, I got very active in politics in 1998. Um, we, we as students uh, interviewed ISA uh, in 1998. And I joined the DAP in late 1999. Uh, it has been 20 years. The last 20 years were very much about saving Malaysia. Of course, Kyrie may not feel that way. <laughs> but I think the next 20 years is about building or rebuilding Malaysia. And it, it, to me, that's how I felt. Uh, the last 20 years, we were very much stuck. Economically, we were stuck in the 1997 Asian economic crisis. Uh, this coalition government that we have now, is a possi there is a possibility where we can heal the wounds of 1998 and eventually move beyond and move forward together. And that perhaps is the challenge and also potential of this current uh, coalition government that brings together the enemies of the 1998 and presenting something into the, for, for the future. It is not easy, but I think that is the potential, th potential of it. And ultimately, what we need is to see that whatever we are working on now is a 20 years project. It is a project to move Malaysia forward into the future so that we have a different Malaysia from the past 20 years and from the years before. Now, I want to revisit the Vision 2020 briefly. Vision 2020 was presented on 28th of February 1991 four months after the October 1990 election. The entire 1980s was remembered as perhaps one of the most divisive era in our history. Racial tension, uh, tensions between Islamists and the government, uh, all sorts of tensions. And of course, very bad economic crisis in 1990, 1985 up until about 1988. Four months after the election, Prime Minister Mahathir presented, the 19, presented Vision 2020 in 1991. There is certainly a political context to it. The political context was in 1990, Tunku Razali challenged uh, the government from the opposition with a semblance of an opposition coalition. It wasn't a one coalition, it was two coalitions, two late co coalitions, but there was this possibility of an opposition coalition challenging Bar Barisan National. And from a very racial 1980s, with Vision 2020, and also with global investment, particularly from Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea in the early 90s. Suddenly, the atmosphere changed. And the entire 1990s, it was a, an era which we all remember as the most prosperous. Suddenly, uh, many people became very rich within a couple of years. And suddenly, the atmosphere became very, very friendly in terms of racial, in terms of uh, many other sentiments, things were quite well managed. And I still remember in the early 90s, I started reading Bahasa newspaper on a daily basis. As a non-Malay, reading Utusan in 1990s was quite okay. Even Utusan was quite Malaysian. It was about memperkasakan Melayu, but it was not about running down others. Even Utusan was readable for anomalies. Because things changed after that. Now, the political impact of Vision 2020 was the Parisian national government won very big in the 1995 election, 1999 election, and the 2004 election. Why? Because it was able to win across racial lines 
it was able to win across South China Sea, and it was able to win majority from all ethnic groups. And that was the three elections in which Parisian National won very well, from the middle, from the center. What is that relevant to what we are doing now? I think what we are doing now is that it is possible to win from the middle. It is possible to win from the center. And it is possible to create a vision that is shared by most people in the middle. Of course, uh, at that time, there is no fake news. There is no uh, uh, what they call social media. But nonetheless, I believe most Malaysians are decent. Most Malaysians are concerned about the same thing. We are divided because no one believes that the middle is actually the most important. We are divided because we are pulled from different front, different sides, because many people don't believe that we Malaysians are very similar, our aspirations are almost the same, and we are one nation. I think most people don't believe that. Especially when, when, when uh, things go wrong, uh, people think that oh, uh, we, we, are not, uh, we are very different. We are different in culture. We may, be, we may have different religious background. But most people are concerned about food on the table. Most people are concerned about jobs. Most people are concerned about decent pay. They are concerned about their environment. They are concerned about whether they have a secured home or secure homeland, I think these are shared concern. Now, the challenge now is that we are now in a democracy where no one calls the editor and say you have overstepped your, your boundary. So everyone can write whatever they like and we have the same type of media uh, which previously were controlled but now have a free hand and they are framing things from racial perspective. So if you talk to the Malays, they say this government is controlled by Lim Kisiang and Lim Guaning. And you talk to the Chinese, they say this government is controlled by that, uh, that old man, Mahathir. But actually, both are wrong. Both are wrong. We are a coalition government. And, but that sort of situation is polarizing. But I think it is important. And, and, when it comes to racial sentiment, when it comes to religious sentiment, it is very emotive. It is naturally emotive. But I think what we in the center, what we in the middle has to do is to make common agenda emotive. Actually, if you take away jobs from someone, it is very emotive. The person loses his pay, the person loses his identity, his children lose homes. So how do we actually come back and make common issues, issues common to Malaysians, emotive, and not, uh, not allowing uh, primordial sentiment to be dominant? I think that is our challenge, and perhaps the challenge for those who want to be prime minister. It is important to, to come back to this point about empathy. How do we build empathy? How do we build this idea that we are almost the same? My father was a taxi driver. My father was a minibus driver. And then he was in MLM. My mother sold lottery ticket. I sold lottery ticket on the streets at the, at the age of 12 and 13. To me, a Malay taxi driver and a Chinese taxi driver or an Indian taxi driver, their life is almost the same. Their aspirations is almost the same. What they want from the government, what they want from the, pub, the, the, the society is almost the same. And what we need is empathy. And I think we need to build trust, we need to build empathy. And this is where, when we talk about this idea of shared prosperity, Shred Prosperity 2030 is something that the Pakatan government is trying to put forward. 
The basic idea is, let's recognize this. In the bottom 40%, among the bottom 40%, 75% are Bumiputra. Let's accept that. Most poor are Bumiputra. But what is the flip side of that? The flip side of that is they are 25% among the bottom 40% are non-Muslim or non-Malays, or non-Bumiputra. That means we need an, a need-based need -based approach. We need to approach this from a need perspective. We need to look at everyone who is at, in that bracket as someone that we need to lift them together so that in order that there is a rising tide and the nation become a better nation. And shared prosperity deals with some of the questions that, that has always been, uh, been uh, con in contention. See, affirmative action, there are many ways to, to do affirmative actions. But what is dominant in this country, especially under the framework of new economic policy, eventually ended up with only focusing on equity, only fo focusing on shares. Muhammad Khalid, uh, the economic advisor to the Prime Minister, said that if you look at the holdings of uh, Amana Saham Bumiputra, among the bottom 40%, averagely, they own 600 ringgit of share. So that way of distribution is not working. But there are other ways. Education, the second E. NEP did very well in its first decade in terms of education. Okay? People were lifted from rural areas, came to colleges, came to university, and then earn a better, li better living, have this idea that there is upward social mobility. The third one is on entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurship, we must always be very caution. Entrepreneurship is not to tell people to sell burger and uh, run a garai. That means entrepreneurship. That is just another way of labor. I think ultimately, we all have to come back to one other E. That E is employment. In order for Malaysian economy to move forward, we have to come back and say that job is the most important shared item that we have to look at. We have to look at job as the, the most important defining factor in order to bring everyone together. I think we need to deal with or create the following conditions. One, we need to invest in technology, 5G, IoT, AI. We need to use, and, and the nation needs to invest in technology in order to cut down the numbers of, in, in order to cut down our reliance and dependence on unskilled foreign labor. Now, most people, when they talk about AI, they say uh, we'll lose job. But in the context of Malaysia, Actually, losing unskilled labor is good for the nation. We need to reduce the number of unskilled labor. We need to create jobs for Malaysian. Instead of thinking of creating many jobs that pay 1,000 ringgit or 1,100 ringgit, we need to create many jobs that pay beyond 4,000 ringgit. But how do you pay a person 4,000 ringgit? It is not to create a job that artificially pay 4,000 ringgit. It is about investing into technology so that instead of having four person or five person doing a job, you reduce it to one person, you invest in the technology and you pay the person two or three times. That is productivity gain. And I think that is something that we have to do. Uh, the second point is we must position ourselves to tap into the, co the current situation global situation in order for us to, uh, to, to position ourselves in the current trade war, how do we actually increase investment into the system? We have been neglecting investment. We have not been investing enough in the system. 
in, in our economy, and we need to start thinking about it. We need to start thinking about investing into people's well-being. Over the last 10 years, especially the last five years, since 2014 oil crunch, the government has not been investing sufficiently on anything. There has been a cutback, that plus there were corruption, and therefore there has, not, there has not been enough investment. For instance, ambulances are very old. Police patrol cars are very old, not to mention military trucks. So we need to invest in well-being of the people. And we also need to unleash the potential of youth and women uh, in the workforce. And I think final point is that we also need to unleash the potential of decentralization. How do we actually decentralize power, devolve power so that state and local authority has more initiative in developing the economy? Now, I think these are issues of game changer across the board and in order to bring more jobs and better jobs for Malaysian. And once we can actually focus on job, uh, focus on on the overall economy, we can bring everyone to the center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I'm sure that the, each of the presenters have comments on each other's uh, this, uh, discussion, but let me open the floor to questions and they could use this opportunity to reply to each other at the same time while answering your question. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I co-chair the Constitutional Law Committee of the Bar Council. Um, I like what uh, Kyrie had said about shots, um, but I'm a little concerned about one thing, in that as we fly off to the moon and have an out-of-the-world experience, we are still very much... Uh, grounded or earthed in a problematic way by what uh, YB Chintong closed his, his comments with, which is about equity and, and, and uh, a race-based policy. Now, the, the Bar Council uh, promoted the uh, ratification by Malaysia of ISA. Uh, and YB Kairi, you uh, in Parliament questioned whether or not the government uh, knew the implications of uh, ratifying ICERT. Uh, in the 15th of October, there's a report in the Malay Mail that basically uh, took a lot of your speech in the Dewan Rakyat. How do you square uh, what you seem to be saying about concerns about uh, the, the problems with 153 with uh, trying to move forward and doing a moonshot that would take us beyond uh, our earthbound ideas and launching Malaysia into the, um, you know, the galaxy, as it were. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ahmad Ghazali. I'm 63 years old. So I, will not, I may not be able to see your moonshot vision <laughs> realised in the future. Uh, I served the army for 25 years. I served the academic, year, uh, academic world uh, for 20 years. So I retired as a professor two years ago. Okay, now you were talk, uh, I agree with YB Khairi that we got to have a moonshot vision for this country. And I also agree with YB Liu uh, that in order to, 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 uh, to, to draw the people into this centrist position or, or, or uh, 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 to discard their extremist views on religions and race, economy is the factor. If we have the bigger pie, you know, they will not be fighting over that, that small slice. Uh, and, and I think that's what YB Liu was uh, trying to imply just now, that, you know, in the 90s, we had a bigger pies. The Malays were confident, they do not feel siege. The Chinese do not feel uh, marginalized. And that is, I think the key is economy. So the moonshot vision, and economy are very important, improve our economy. But what puzzles me, as a 63-year-old man who served the army for 25 years and served the academic for 20 years, and I still puzzle is on our education. What can black shoes and proficiency in, in cut 
improve our education system. I think this is the most important thing. Education is the key to everything. No country who have a bunch of, I would know you, uh, you know, students who are not that intellectually proficient can go any higher than they are. So I think education is, and I think YB Kairi, you should focus on education uh, in, 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 in your think Thank tank you. group. Yeah. Hello, <clears throat> Raymond. It's wonderful to be here. I may be the only guy from the Merdeka generation. <laughs> it's inspiring listening to all the three panelists, uh, Professor Wu. My question is actually deja vu. In the 60s, we were thrilled by the new economic policy, which meant well, but it went awry. Why? Because some greedy politicians took over the management. I am afraid, at my age particularly, that we might be going through the same process. The aspirations expressed by the panelists are great. But I think we should ask ourselves, what went wrong and why? I think it is irresponsible leadership, not right across the board, but in very key areas. Also greed, racism, religious bigotry, katoananship, all these issues are still there. And unless we can have some solutions to overcome these problems, all that we aspire for will honestly come to naught. And so I asked the panel, what would they do as a matter of priority to remove the constraints, the obstacles that have kept us back and not move forward like many others around us who are going to overtake us? Why repeat our mistakes? How do we do it? Thank you. Okay, um, I'm just going to touch on the um, questions, even though it wasn't directly asked of me. But I just no, some comments. Just some it comments. Have to ask. Sure, sure, sure. Just, just some comments. The answer. Yes, yes, Profu. I will try to attempt to. I give my thoughts on it. The, fir the first one uh, by Andrew. Um, now, I, I would like to offer uh, my view in terms of um, what uh, led me to even initiate some of the programs on the ground. You know, I, I'm still a politician. So at the end of the day, as politicians, as legislators, you have to have a degree um, of political guile. You know, you have um, a gradual manner, try to, try to convince the majority to support... Um, uh, and provide a conducive environment for your projects to succeed. As such, when I chose harm reduction um, initially, even that particular issue, it could be something which could be controversial if I started on saying, hey, let's talk about legalization of illicit drugs or, or decriminalization for that matter. Um, so what made sense was to make sure the MOS committee members, you know, adopt this approach, which helped those afflicted with addiction uh, amongst them in society. So I think in any issues, for that matter, you have to have some degree of political guile in order to implement changes in a nation which is always fraught with political and religious fault lines. I mean, that's the reality that we face, right? So that's my view. So even on harm reduction per se, there is some degree of, uh, you know, after discussion, after meeting with the different muftis, um, you know, I came up with this particular plan. Um, and again, you know, to, to get the approval of the Mufti was a, f a main condition. You know, it's not just we want to have something done uh, without addressing the different stakeholders. And I think in Malaysia, knowing fully well the different challenges, you must begin the process of engagement. So that will help you in convincing the, those uh, stakeholders to make sure uh, things are done, yeah? Um, number two, uh, the questions by Encik um, Ahmad Ghazali. I would, would say this. 
I always try to focus on, on the concept of uh, effective mindsets and I cannot agree, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. Education system, you want to build more centrist, you start with the education system, right? You want to build more uh, degree of inclusion, uh, everything begins in school. So one of the other projects we're also doing is, um, of course, is an example of recycling for life, but you introduce it at, uh, to seven-year-olds at the primary level, at the rural uh, schools, and you basically say you bring these recycled bottles and then in exchange you get cash in your account, which is Bank Negara approved. My point being, extend that to politics. I think we have to think outside the box here, right? We, we often think, oh, recycling, that's not you know, uh, juicy enough. Uh, but really, if you extend that particular aspect and topic to everything else, that's how you build sort of um, support from, from the majority and um, hopefully from there you discard racist viewpoints and of course people will say you have different systems of education system you know SJKC, SJKT but I always remember again it's about understanding the background have some degree of empathy Chintong mentioned empathy many times so if we start the discourse and make sure and this leads up, leads up to Tan Sri Raymond's uh, question we make sure the government especially the mainstream, because you will expect, you know, uh, different extremists or different uh, points of view to emerge in a democracy. It, it, that's the reality we face. Different pockets will be there. But the national narrative must be one that unites. It shouldn't be adding spice, um, whatever else, yeah, to make things far more uh, complicated. It should really be regulated and a lot of thought and wisdom, again, political guile, placed in drawing a particular narrative forward. And I um, wanted to say, in terms of even the NAP, the key aspect is, of course, assessment. You know, you, in any program that you do, that's why the social um, progress assessment bit, an independent assessment, objective, um, non-biased, way of looking at the government's programs. Perhaps equity alone definitely is not reflective uh, of the level that we would like to achieve. So, you know, it's about having the system working to achieve the particular end and no political interference before we reach the goal. Um, and once you have the systems in place, for example, how should PAC be set up? If you have certain parameters in place, then we'll reduce the possibility of, of problems in future. So that's, uh, again, back, back on to systemic reforms and just my, my viewpoints to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to respond to Tansri Raman's uh, question. You see, most of us grew up with this idea that Malaysia is exceptionally multiracial and multi-ethnic and multi-religious. Malaysia is special, and because of that, we, we have all the problems of identity politics. Actually, you look around the world, even the US uh, is troubled by identity politics. The world is actually quite the same. India, uh, India is troubled by identity politics, and sometimes uh, they import it into Malaysia. What is the real Malaysian exceptionalism now, I think, is that if we can actually run a democracy in a multi ethnic society and run it well and also handle economic distribution well, I think that is Malaysian exceptionalism. Not so much of us being a multi ethnic society. Being a multi ethnic society is quite common. The question is only degree. So I think what we need to do is to see that we have this historic role to create a multi ethnic society in a democracy where you, you have spe free speech, where you have uh, free press, but at the same time you can still maintain cohesiveness, cohesiveness of a nation. That is challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, first of all, just a quick response to Chintong. 
Um, thank you very much for being an aggressive proponent of me becoming Prime Minister. Um, I, I, it's, it's like the movie Inception, you know. Um, once Chintong has put it out there into Malaysians, Malaysian minds, it's going to happen. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Chintong. Thank you very much. And that was a joke. Media jangan tulis KJ nak jadi Perdana Menteri. Come on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Andrew, Andrew, uh, Andrew Kuba Council, um, th thanks for uh, the observation. Um, first of all, uh, in relation to, to ISET uh, and, and the particular debate that took place, this was when uh, Foreign Minister Saifuddin Abdullah uh, presented the foreign policy, the new framework of, of the foreign policy under, under uh, Malaysia Baru or Pakatan Harapan. And I noticed at that point in time that one of the uh, manifesto promises was ratification of certain um, international instruments and conventions, ICERT being one of them. And uh, this was before the whole ICERT thing blew up. So I stood up and I said, um, was the minister aware of the implications uh, in wanting to ratify or sign and accede to, to ICED. I said, you know, it's not something that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has never thought about. Obviously, as a member of the international community, we think about these things all the time. But I said there are certain implications which you need to be aware of, one of which was uh, trying to reconcile certain constitutional provisions that we have uh, with the international treaty itself, and this is subject to great debate. Uh, that was all I said, and I said, you know, look, you better go and uh, and 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 syndicate, i.e., talk to all the stakeholders before you go go ahead and and sign this thing and ratify this thing. Uh, to which the response I thought was um, was typical of um, uh, the sort of uh, Jesus Christ mentality of Pakatan government then: walk on water. You know, we can do anything. Uh, and he just dismissed it and said, uh, "We're going to get this done. You couldn't do it; we'll be able to do it." And I just said, please watch out, because uh, you will probably end up having the same problems we did when we thought about ratifying some of these instruments. Uh, and sure enough, fast forward two months later, uh, he backed down from it. Uh, simply because I thought there was um, a superciliousness or, the, or, or uh, an arrogance of uh, a GE bounds uh, that thought um, they were invincible. And uh, that, that was it. You know, that was in terms of ICERT. I feel that as an instrument itself, it's not uh, problematic in principle. I think there are conditions that you can attach to it. But obviously, um, because there was no humility in wanting to sell that, that policy, the political nous or, or the political guile that Isa spoke about, that's when he lost the ground. And when you lose the ground, it's over. Uh, it, things become simplified. In, in, uh, I said it's against the Malays, it's against Islam. You cannot recover from that because you didn't have the humility in the first place to say, can we talk about this? You know, this is an instrument that many people have signed. Can we think about signing this? It doesn't necessarily have to abrogate 153 in the constitution, etc. So I think um, you need political nous, political guile or political touch. Uh, in, in trying to um, make sure that your moonshots are well uh, syndicated and there's buy-in from as many people uh, as, as possible. But Andrew, I want to touch on the elephant in the room. You know, I, I, I tend to try to cut through the fluff and go straight to the point here. Straight to the point here is that we need to, the Malays especially, have to resolve the Malay dilemma once and for all. You know? Um, th this, this country has a very unique setup uh, in its constitution. The constitution is a reflection of the values of the country when it was set up. Uh, and this country has a unique constitution, and it's explicitly said. It's not like the, the US constitution during the Declaration of Independence where they held truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal, but they weren't. They were slaves. It was only after the Civil War, the Reconstruction Constitution, the 14th Amendment of Equal Rights before the law under Abraham Lincoln, that you created the United States as it is today. But in Malaysia, it's explicit. Article 153, there is a special position that is attached to the Malays and the natives of uh, Sabah and Sarawak. So how we deal with this in the future will determine how we end up as a nation, and what vision we can get as a nation. Because this article means different things to different people. 
you know. For some Malays, it means a light touch. It means that the agong, in the words I'm paraphrasing in the Constitution, can reserve certain places, scholarships, permits, contracts for the Malays and the natives of Sabah and Sarawak using his discretion, presumably based on the advice of the government. To certain, things, to certain people, 153 is carte blanche. Everything from your Bumiputra discounts at golf clubs, house, houses, everything is drawn from the spirit if not from the letter of 153. So the Malay community has to decide, or Bumiputra community has to decide. The word Bumiputra is not in the constitution. Malay is a native of Sabah and Sarawak. They have to decide, you know, what is the interpretation of 153 in the future? Is it light touch? Is it going to be a heavy-handed encroachment of the state? And this is the new Malay dilemma that needs to be resolved. Once that's resolved, every other corollary issue that comes with it how the NEP looks like in the future, can be resolved. And that's not an easy thing to do. Because as Isa spoke about multidimensional deprivation, it's not just uh, income, but it's in so many different measurements that there is, in the words of uh, Dr. Muhammad Khalid, economic advisor to the Prime Minister, there's a colour to inequality. And it's not just Malays, it's Indians as well. And it's Chinese as well sometimes. So to navigate... Um, what happens in terms of race relations, we have to be quite clear in, in what our understanding of 153 is, what our understanding of what equality means in Malaysia, and how this translate, translates into uh, policy and politics. Chiamma Ghazali spoke about moonshot and the people's economy. I don't want moonshots to be divorced from the people's economy. If there's anything that uh, our three speeches ha have meant or touched on is that nothing can be devoid of impact to the people. If you create a moonshot, which is sending the first Malaysian into space, which we did, which was essentially an offset for a military purchase, it doesn't have any benefit to the, to the people's economy. So the moonshot must be something that creates jobs, that creates technology, that creates new industry, that has impact for people. So it's not a moonshot which benefits just one person, but it's a moonshot that is grounded in the reality that is a vision shared, and not just a vision imagined to be shared. Tansri, Ramon, you speak of NEP, and uh, as I understand, as I understand it, you were you were responsible for for initially conceptualizing the NEP at that time with Professor Jus Fallen, and then subsequently in government. We have to remember that the NEP is two-pronged. It's eradication of poverty irregardless of race. And I'm glad to say that even under the previous government, uh, we started to look at B40 through non-racial terms. It was a policy that was elucidated in the Malaysia plan that eradication of poverty, cash transfers, previously BRIM, now known as BSH, would be colorblind. So, there was a move towards that. But the second problem of the NEP is always, again, the ele elephant in the middle of the room, that's a bit more problematic. That was the eradication of the identification of race with economic function. Simply put, the restructuring of society. So you didn't want, at that point in time, Malays to be identified as farmers, as lower-level policemen, as lower-level civil servants. You didn't want the Chinese just to be identified as business people, and you didn't want the Indians just to be identified as people, as laborers in their state. So there was this massive, ambitious project at restructuring society with all the policy instruments in place. So this is something that we need to look at, whether or not it's been abused, whether or not there's too much overreach. But for me, what I want to see is Malay economic empowerment so that they don't necessarily want to continue to be reliant on the state. I don't think it is a matter of pride for Malays to say that the state is there for me. I think eventually Malays should want to pride themselves on succeeding without the state. Resolving the new Malay dilemma will suggest that Malays who have made it don't need the state anymore. They, know they don't need to, the, the state to intervene in the market to help them. Resolving the new Malaysian dilemma is to make sure that all Malaysians, regardless of ethnicity, get the chance and opportunity that they deserve. There's no Chinese 
or Indian boy or girl that scores straight A's in the SPM that is denied a scholarship in the future. So these are things I think that we need to work towards. It's not easy, but until you slay these sacred cows or these sacred elephants in the middle of the room, you're just talking around the issue and skirting the real issue at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lukmanul Hakim. I'm, uh, I run my own uh, advertising agency. Um, so thank you so much for um, creating this event. Thank you so much uh, YB Liu Chintong, YB KJ and YB Nuriza for being here. Um, when we talk about um, when we talk about Malaysia as a new a new vision and new um, a new story of Malaysia beyond 2020, I, I like the fact that YB Liu Chintong um, described Malaysia in a, in a way it's including Sabah and Sarawak, all right. But uh, despite of the despite of that description. Um, we still don't have speakers from Sabah and Sarawak, as per se. Um, maybe this is something that uh, Jeffrey Chia Institute um, could look into. And uh, th while this um, forum is, I believe, is very beneficial, um, I always believe that there's always room for improvement. All right. Um, all right. Um, um, on my is, second is point. Is that your question? No, no, no. I actually I want to uh, share my opinion. Um, I believe that for us to move forward as a country, um, we need to be in a in a in a in a momentum where unity is the the engine of this beautiful nation. So, with that being said, I believe that um, our second uh, our second question is now that is education is a is a tool for unity. Is that I believe that we cannot achieve unity with, uh, with having uh, different schools in Malaysia. So um, maybe uh, YB Liu, as part of the government this day, um, can, give him, uh, can give his um, views on the government's policy in terms of education, whether can we have uh, unity schools beyond 2020. And uh, maybe maybe last one, maybe um, YBKJ and YB Nuriza also can give their, their their views on this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Andrew from Sunway University. The government announced e-healing regulation in November 2018. If implemented properly, it could lead to better safety for the public and maybe even higher incomes for the drivers because the commissions that platforms like Grab will take will actually reduce from 25% to 20%. Implementation began in April this year and was intended to be completed in July. Additional facilitation was provided by Grab, such as subsidies uh, to meet the regulatory requirements, online training to make it easy, mass exams, and even flexi insurance so that part-time drivers can get insurance that commensurate to actually when they uh, provide the service. However, when the deadline came on 12 July, only 10% of 200,000 Grab drivers were legalized. And on my car, only 4% out of the 10,000 full-time drivers were legalized. I had the opportunity to speak to a Grab driver. He was a young IT professional who had lost his job. So he was a Grab driver temporarily to try to meet ends meet. So I asked him, did he have a problem to legalize? He said, no problem. And then I asked him why so many of his colleagues had. And he gave me this wrestling. Um, so he said, uh, many of his colleagues felt rasa leche. So my question to the panelists is, do you think in Malaysian uh, community, do we have a culture of leche? And this culture of leche is provide, uh, preventing us from achieving excellence and becoming a globally world-class country. Thank you. I was actually very impressed with all the talk. I hope all these young politicians in the future would not be like our old wise men who do U-turn. My question is, we have been living in Malaysia within a quota system, racial and uh, religious quota. And 
you were saying that metro, uh, metro can see and all this, there's no racial thing, but based on what I know, even recently, the so-called Pakatan government, government with hope, the says that when people pressure on the racial line, the racial line, they U-turn many times. So I want to get a comment on SSC, the Pakatan politician here. What will they do if one day they are in power? And also our expired prime minister, what do you do if you will ever become a prime minister one day? Thank you. i start with uh, Lokman, uh, Lokman's uh, question just now. If we wanted a single school system, which personally I think is the best way to, to foster, not the best way, lah, one of the best ingredients to foster unity. I mean, just, it just makes sense. If you have kids in the same school playing together, it's, it's, uh, it's intuitive that they will become more united in the future, right? Uh, I believe that it, it, it does foster unity and it's one of the most powerful uh, um, ways to foster unity. I remember I had a... Uh, conversation with Lee Kuan Yew before he passed away. So I said, um, and, and Singapore by no means is a paragon of unity, but um, I said, you know, what did you do to try to address unity? He said three things. One is education. You know, we only have uh, national schools in Singapore. He doesn't have vernacular schools. He allows for international schools, but there's a small quota for Singaporeans to go to national schools. It's just national schools in Singapore. Secondly, national service. So they have to go for uh, military service. Singapore men, Singaporean men have to go for two years national service. And three, uh, he said the, the HDBs, public housing. So he doesn't allow for, um, for ghettos, uh, single racial ghettos. So it has to be well mixed, as mixed as possible uh, in, in Singapore. So we missed the education one. If we wanted a single education system, we should have done it in 1957 or, or 1963. Uh, but the terms of our union, so to speak, allowed for vernacular schools. Once you allow for vernacular schools, it's difficult to unravel it. See, if, if somebody said yeah, today, uh, we have one single education system, which means in, in the mind of certain people, no more Chinese uh, vernacular schools, no more uh, Tamil vernacular schools. Then somebody will come and say, what about your, your madrasa? What about your scholar, scholar uh, pondo? You know, you have to get rid of that also. And then uh, kids, any parents who send their kids to international school, private schools, what happens to that as well? So it's a policy nightmare not to mention a nightmare in terms of politics, you know? So, I believe it's a non-starter. What is a moonshot goal, however, is national schools becoming the automatic school of choice in 20 years or in 30 years. That it's so good that you want to send your kids there. So that's what we have to aspire to. I don't know how we're going to get there. That's a real moonshot. That's a Mars shot, if you ask me right now. But, um, but you know, that should be the moonshot. You know, but, but beating the, the, the drums of single school system, as I philosophically agree with, it's tough. Because politically, you've missed the moment. Um, just quickly, Rasa Leche. I mean, there is a bit of that. You know, there is a bit of that. I mean, that's why you have phrases like, uh, you know, lebih kurang, kurang lebih. It's never accurate, is it? It's lebih kurang. Um, but, you know, I think we have to have a, a, a culture of, of, of excellence, of wanting to finish the job and get the job done. You know, I think uh, Mahathir phase one, which was the first time he was prime minister, I don't know if you all remember this, but he focused a lot on culture. You know, he loved Japan. Because the Japanese to him were the paragon of hard work and ethics. You know, they get up early, they're on time. Uh, even though, you know, the, the salaried man in Japan in the 1980s get drunk every night, but they were still on time every morning. Uh, so to him, it was all about that. And I think he was not misplaced. I think culture plays a big part in, in whether or not we're going to succeed. Um, and and so, uh, U-turns, we're all guilty of U-turns. And sometimes... U-turns are not a bad thing. Sometimes U-turns are not a bad thing. I, I always think, you know, U-turn is always so negative, pejorative. U-turn means, you know, you made a mistake. Uh, but sometimes it's also a sign of humility. Yes, of course, you should have thought about it before you decided. But, you know, we all make mistakes. And I'd rather have a leader who is uh, able and humble enough to admit his mistakes and to say, I've made a mistake, I'm sorry, rather than somebody who says that, you know, uh, I insist that I'm right and uh, you are wrong. 
Uh, and I think, you know, having gone through a very humbling experience at the last general election, um, I don't think having the humility to say I was wrong is necessarily a bad thing. Thank you. Isa wants to have the last word, so um, yeah, I, I think um, for Kyrie to be prime minister, he has to leave Amno because Amno is not in the center. Uh, I, I just want to say, how can that be the last word? Not fair, lah. <laughs> In terms of education, I think ultimately we have to come back to one important philosophical question. Do we believe that we can only master one language or we can actually master multiple languages? Now, if we can resolve that question, then at some point, and it is happening. Among Chinese school, uh, there, are, there are more Malay students in Chinese school than Chinese students in national school. Now, if the national schools are school of choice, uh, which is really good, multilingual, multicultural, I don't see that as a problem. And at some point, if the Chinese school has 50% Malay students, it's a national school. Of course, it's very far-fetched. But the point is, once we no longer fear each other's languages, once we no longer fear others, fear the others, but we see that as a heritage of the nation. We see that each of us can speak multiple languages, each of us can master multiple languages, and this is the, the characteristic of the nation. Then the questions of um, single schools and all this will, no, will not arise. Thank you. Okay, I, I really wanted to start uh, to discuss or to address the issue of um, national schools. I think enough has been said in terms of it not being a non-starter to discuss the closure of vernacular schools. But my point being as, um, I mean, I went to government school, Sekolah uh, Kebangsaan. Chinta went to SJKC. So in a way, it's good that we came together, sort of seeing the different, um, the similarities that we share. And the bigger problem in Malaysia, I think we talk about education, just take, for instance, even just the national schools. We can't even seemingly stick to the policy decided by one particular minister. Um, we keep changing uh, post-election, pre-election, uh, post-ministerial, new, minister, new minister, whatever. I, I believe that even the issue of PPSMI, it was a very difficult issue to carry because there was so much um, hang-ups over it by different groups. Uh, those in the urban centers feel very comfortable because their kids would learn English and that's what they speak in at home. But imagine the kid who's studying in Kedah or even in Kelantan, the teacher himself or herself would not have the ability to speak proper English. So even at the policy level, it wasn't decided based on UNESCO recommendations. It was decided because at the time, the Prime Minister was very supportive of PPSMI. And then we, of course, miss the different targets in the TIMS and PISA rankings. And for the life of me, I keep saying, can we just be objective in discussing education? Um, in England, they had a great debate in 1988 where different stakeholders were asked their points of view. But the great debate excluded politicians. Because, you know, when you talk about education, and just take the sekolah kebangsaan. We really need to start thinking together um, um, not you know, having even an urban and rural divide because that divide is very real. And in the case of PPSMI, what you say today, I'm not going to go deep into it, it reflects that we can't um, focus on what works best on the, for the students, but really what works best um, for our own uh, enclaves. Uh, that's one, yeah. So start thinking as a, as a nation. Start with sekolah kebangsaan first and foremost. Uh, number two, um, in terms of a culture of leche, um, I really try my, my very best uh, to to rely on this culture of the experts know best. So I, I believe in every opportunity that you have, the spaces, whether you know at the Jeffrey Chia Institute, you create your own culture per se. Uh, and if you want to start a revolution, it, it starts with that readiness to promote experts. And what we have done, even in the context of Pramatang Power, there is also a divide, the island versus the mainland. Um, and for Sekolah Agama Rakyat, who's asking for assistance, I force them uh, to take the architects that we uh, propose, and most of them are from the island. 
predominantly Chinese, but that social engagement element has to be actively thought out by policymakers. So sometimes you want to win hearts and minds. You can't just decide and dictate. It's not a social uh, engineering at work. You have Singapore, maybe that can help. Yeah, As a smaller state, it's easier to manage. But if you have a country like Malaysia, Lukman mentioned Sabah and Sarawak, the diversity is, is huge. And certainly you have to take into account and it begins with some degree uh, of social engagement uh, at every level that can be implemented. So I think the time is up. Thank you uh, for that. Yeah. Well, we certainly had a good lunch hour eating up the words of the three of you. So let us give a big hand to our three discussants again. And we thank you, members of the audience, for your patience and participation. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.